Internet of Things got coined back in 1999. Not by this guy, but it was somebody from MIT that actually coined this in a presentation to uh, Procter & Gamble. Um, but it was becoming uh, fairly well thought of, the concept, uh, with business. And it pretty much stayed in the realm of business at that time. Um, and what, what it actually is, is back in the 90s, uh, the internet was people talking to web servers and so forth, accessing data created by people, web pages and so forth. That was, that was the, in, almost the entire focus of the web. There were aspects of the internet that were, went beyond that, but the web itself was uh, uh, really focused on people-generated data for people. Today, we're looking at something um, where it's expanding rather rapidly into things talking to things, things talking to people, uh, things talking to servers to collect data and so forth, and where in the past the source of information largely came from people, now we're also seeing its information that's about our environment, gathered by these sensors and so forth, these things that, uh, that are a part of the Internet of Things. Uh, I'm going to talk about four basic aspects of, of where this is fitting into our world today. Uh, home and auto, uh, where we're monitoring, monitoring the things in, in where we live and, and drive and so forth. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> personal, where we actually are finding wearable things that monitor us or in some way directly uh, provide us with information. In business, the things that are important to business and uh, monitoring things that in our community are going to make our life a little bit easier. Oop, let me back up a bit. Uh, when we look at, at in the home, uh, each of these areas have uh, a different term that r really relates to the Internet of Things. Uh, in our home, we talk about smart devices, we talk about smart cars, and so forth. Uh, and what's shown here is the Nest uh, smart thermo uh, um, thermostat, which is, is sort of the iconic smart device. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and some other examples. Um, personally, uh, an area that, that we talk about are wearables. Uh, another area that has just come into to fashion is the idea of M health or mobile health, and these are devices monitoring us uh, and so forth. In business, back in the late 1990s, they talked about M to M, machine to machine communication, uh, where we used RFID devices to on, on items to track each individual item. Uh, today we're looking at it to actually monitor machines, monitor the health of machines, and so forth. In, Smitty, in cities, uh, we talk about smart cities. Uh, and I'll go into some examples of, of where we see uh, Internet of Things in smart cities. So what's enabling this actually explosion of smart devices and uh, the Internet of Things? Well, first off, it's a well-established uh, internet. It's it's truly pervasive. Has access to everybody. Uh, you, you can get it to get to it anywhere in the world. You've also seen a really wide deployment of wireless technologies, uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth predominantly. You see that in our home. You see it in a business. Uh, you see it anywhere, and in a lot of cities, it's it's ubiquitous within a particular city. Um, where a city is taken to actually providing that Wi-Fi service uh, throughout the city. Uh, there's been a great advances in micro-miniaturization, sensors and actuators that are very small and can sense just about anything. They can replicate our, our senses in, in looking at the environment and actually recording it. And then actuators that can actually act on their, our environment in different ways. And then microcontrollers and microprocessors have gone through uh, very extreme miniaturization. And with that, not just size, but power consumption, making it very easy for the replication and the use of small devices throughout our, our community. 
And then finally, everyone has a, a smartphone. Almost everyone. And anyone that doesn't have a smartphone probably isn't going to care much about IoT anyway. So, <laughs> um, so it, it is nearly a ubiquitous device for the uh, transmission of information to somebody. Uh, and also, in the hands of someone, it becomes a universal controller to control the environment around you. So a little bit more on IoT in the home and some examples. Um, in the lower left is something called August Door Locks, and these are, are electronic locks. They run about $250, and actually Apple sells them. Uh, what you see on the outside there is practically all there is to it. There's no wiring to, to do this. It's all contained within the, the actual uh, lock itself. And it connects to a cell phone until it connects to your home wireless system and ultimately connects to the internet. So that when you're out somewhere, you can see whenever your door opens, uh, you'll know if somebody's entering your house and no one's supposed to be there, uh, and so forth. Uh, in the upper left is a device called the Delphi Connect that plugs into your car uh, in what's called the uh, OBD port. Uh, which is, uh, if you've seen those, um, oh, what are those commercials where you, you see an insurance company gives you a device, you can plug it in and it tracks how good a driver you are and then gives you insurance breaks based on that. That's what this is doing, only they're, they're just kind of spying on how, how your car is being driven and uh, then adjusting your insurance rates accordingly. This is for you to use, so you can actually track all of the, the um, aspects of what's happening in your car. And this, this, this OBD port is a port that has been, that is pretty much standardized throughout all reasonably contemporary automobiles. Uh, it, it can tell you where you've been, how fast you're going. That would be an interesting thing to have if you've got a, a new teenage driver and track actually how fast they're driving. Um, but it, uh, so it can track all that. It also gives you the same maintenance information that you used to have to take your car to a service station to see. You get an engine, check engine light on. Well, you can just use this to, to actually um, get in and see what in the heck's causing that. And the other thing you can do is if you've got uh, electronic um, key fob type openers for your doors, and you lose them, this device can actually operate your, the doors in your car uh, as well. So you have a cell phone, you can pull it up and you can open your door or close your door or turn on the emergency alarm uh, as well. Uh, Philips lights, that's, an, that's the next one. It's called the Philips Hue. These are, are devices that you can put into any light fixture. Uh, and you can control them uh, individually. So you can have different lights around your house and with your cell phone, control how bright that light is, how bright light that is, uh, what color that light is. And so you can affect the hue of it, the, the color, as well as the brightness. Uh, and they're all LED, so they're very low power. Uh, the Nest, which I uh, had mentioned earlier, it's, it's sort of the iconic smart device. Uh, it's really a very... Uh, a, I mean, it, 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 again, you just use your cell phone to control your thermostat from anywhere in the world. Uh, more commonly from your easy chair. So rather than getting up to turn on the heat or turn on the air conditioning, you just pick up your cell phone and do it. Uh, and in fact, I've got a Honeywell, um, one of these, that, that we got installed when we put in a new heat pump. And I thought, well, who needs this? And all of a sudden you find yourself thinking, this is really cool. I mean, I can, I can program it to do anything I want. It's getting really hot, but I'm, I'm in Seattle and I want to turn on the air conditioning. I can, I can do that from Seattle or wherever I am. Finally, the other one's a Sonus, and uh, this is another system that I have, which I found just absolutely incredible. Again, and, and, but it's, and it's in being incredible. One, because it consolidates all of your music, all of your audio sources, into one device and then spreads it out however you want. Sonus is known as a wireless speaker system. I don't have the speaker aspects, I just have a wireless connector that connects all of these 
uh, audio sources into my stereo system. So again, sitting with my Wi-Fi or with my uh, cell phone, I can pull up my um, uh, iTunes music library, sele select whatever I want to play. I can pull in uh, Pandora, anything off the internet, radio stations uh, from anywhere in the country, in the world. So you want to hear a radio station in, in Africa, you can do that. Uh, as well as picking the audio, feed the audio to my stereo system from my TV or whatever. I find it really an incredibly, it, it, it solves a problem that I've been trying to solve for some, some time, and that's to have a single source that consolidates any audio that would go into your home. So that's IoT in the home. IoT on the person. Uh, that first one you see, that picture of a baby, uh, is called a Mimi, Mimo baby monitor. It's 200 bucks. Uh, and, what you, and what it does is actually biometrically tracks your child. <laughs> Which sounds a little silly as to why you do that, but one of the things they're trying to solve is detecting an onslaught of, sl onslaught of SIDS and being able to alert you. Uh, so it says your child is no longer breathing the way it should. It, it will wake you up. Uh, but typically it'll, it'll just tell you how your child's sleeping through the night. You can look at it and see that your child's, whether it's sleeping on its back or not, and so forth. Um, the next one to the right of that is called the Fitbit, which you've probably heard about. It's a fitness tracker. Uh, you can, hi. Uh, and you can wear that. Um, it, it will track anything you want to, uh, to know about your exercise program, where, where you've walked, um, how many steps you've taken, uh, actually sh plot out on a map where you've been and so forth. There are other devices, and this also tr tells you how well you slept the night before and so forth. There are other devices that will track even more uh, aspects of maybe your heart and so forth and can anticipate or tell when you're about to have some cardiac event. It'll tell you and it will also tell your doctor and uh, potentially the uh, uh, dispatch uh, an ambulance uh, while you're just still thinking you're having chest pains. So it's, um, you know, it could be a potentially big lifesaver. Uh, in the lower right is something called, um, what is that called? Glow cap. It, it fits on a medicine bottle and it alerts people, uh, and this is handy for if you've got senior parents or something, to remind them that they need to take their medicine. And it will actually have detached from that uh, a something that you can plug in that will light up and saying you, say you haven't taken your medicine today. It will track when it's been taken and then turn it off. And there's also a button on, on the top that you can press and that automatically creates a reorder of that medicine at your local pharmacy that will then have available for you. And then finally, there is are these uh, tags that electronically track something. In the same way, your iPhone, can. You, you, there's an app that will tell you where it is at any point in time if you lose it. This does the exact same thing. You can put it on your keys, you can put it on any device you have, and uh, you can tell exactly where you left that. In industry, uh, there's... A, as I said, the kind of the beginning of this was RFIDs placed on individual items to use for inventory tracking. So that not only could you just scan something and say, oh, there's one of those things that is going down here, it will now identify there is that thing, which is number 17 of that shipment that we got in, and it's going to that truck. And once it's on that truck, you can still tell exactly what, where that particular uh, item is. So it gives you very granular uh, inventory tracking. <clears throat> Uh, the next one on the lower right is something from John Deere that is um, used as an agricultural field monitor. It, you can have it hooked up to uh, uh, irrigation systems that will tell not just irrigate this time of day or so forth, but will actually look at soil moisture and irrigate according, accordingly. So it gives you the kind of optimal use of resources to achieve um, a good uh, good crop yield. 
And then finally, general machinery. Oh, and the other thing with deer is they are now building into every one of their, their agricultural uh, uh, pieces of equipment uh, a device that will communicate to, the, to a deer um, server that will anticipate or tell how well that piece of equipment is doing, whether it's a, a, you're about to have problems with it. It will also analyze how you're using it within your fields and give you recommendations how to better use that to optimize your crop yield. And then finally, just monitoring equipment uh, to try and anticipate failures of the equipment so that you can do predictive maintenance uh, and not reactive maintenance. Finally, in the community, uh, I don't know how many of you use Bus Tracker, but I came here from Chicago, and I couldn't have lived without my Bus Tracker app. I'd be down in the loop, and I lived in the South Loop, and I needed to take a bus home. I'd pull this up and say, is the bus on Clark Street coming any sooner than the bus on State Street? And I'd get to the right bus stop a minute or two before the bus would, and it's absolutely predictable. It uses GPS tracking that's actually put into the buses uh, and then fed into, uh, ultimately fed into your, that app. Uh, there's, there are parking apps in which you can get an entire community to, to cooperate, and um, uh, those, those parking apps, you have the different parking lots actually feed in how much parking space they have. Um, and so that when you go into Seattle and you want to go to a Pike Place Market, you can pull this up and you can see that every lot is full except this one. They have 17 spaces left, so you know exactly where to go to park your car. Uh, smart street lights. Uh, these are, are a very good source of saving energy within a community. It saves between 30 and 50% uh, of the use the lighting costs. Uh, but what it does, it, it first of all knows exactly when you need lighting, it knows how much lighting you need, and on certain areas, uh, say after hours, it can dim, dim the lights uh, fairly substantially, but detect traffic and light up the traffic path as it's going. So it, it's very, I mean, it's, it's absolutely optimizing the use of lights in the community. And then finally, at the bottom, there are these things called uh, smart belly trash cans. And if they look familiar, they should, because these are actually in ba on Bainbridge Island. And they're right, on, uh, right in the downtown area. We have about five of them. They're, they are uh, powered by uh, photo cells. They do automatic trash count compacting. And they report how full they are. And what's cool about this is that then when on trash pickup, you can optimize at the start of the pickup, you optimize the route to hit just the tracks, trash cans that are needed uh, for pickup. So, uh, and this is all part of, of what people are beginning to call uh, the smart city. So what are the impediments to the acceptance of, of uh, the internet of things? First is, uh, public acceptance of smart devices. Is that likely? And, and the answer to that is probably, that's gonna be simpler, as similar to the public acceptance of the internet. Uh, there are some people that in the long run will probably resist it forever. But people adopted that technology very quickly and it's very likely that the same's gonna happen here. Um, so industry commitment to IoT uh, would be the next issue, but it turns out that it's industry that's really driving this whole area. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the major players there. So that's not an issue at all. Open source standards. Um, there needs to be open source standards for interoperability and device naming. That's pretty good, but it's not great. Uh, there are, uh, I think in Europe and the US, different standards emerging for device naming and so forth. Um, but if you look at addressing, one of the key issues, addressing for these massive number of devices, that's all already basically done with the IP, uh, IPv6 addressing scheme for the internet, which has been adopted and is being deployed. Uh, also, the, the need for low power and low data rate uh, networking uh, is, is 
well deployed and it's uh, there's a new standard or new yeah new standard called Zigbee that is really although it's not very common in the normal uh, in our normal use of, of communication technologies it's it's actually deployed fairly extensively in some of these devices I've just talked about uh, finally is security you may have heard about this but there was a Jeep uh, that had certain IOT features that actually most cars do with these smart cars uh, and these two hackers that, that have worked in trying to hack automotive systems and so forth and they're actually not quite white hat hackers probably gray white hat hackers uh, because they really what they do is identify it and then publicize it to the uh, makers of the car and so forth um, this G, the, so they, they got a friend who has one of these new Jeeps and said I want you to try this out they, and they were back in, in a house a quarter of a mile away or something and they said um, whatever you do don't panic <laughs> but go drive your Jeep around a little bit so he got in and he started driving and all of a sudden the air conditioning went on and then the the radio station changed and it got really loud and then the the video display on his car had the picture of these two guys pop up on it and then all of a sudden power was slowly diminishing in the car and eventually he just he just cut it off altogether and the, and the guy really was kind of freaking out it turns out this is a serious uh, breach that Jeep has they're doing a recall to, to fix this and these guys are going to be presenting at a black hat conference uh, I think in a, in a month or so to talk about this and other exposures that they found uh, then of course I think most of us have heard about the Stuxnet uh, hack on Iran where um, the United States purportedly sabotaged some of their nuclear facilities uh, that used microprocessors and they were able to sabotage those microprocessors uh, which was good for us but it represents a real clear indication of what could happen uh, with international terrorism with uh, sabotaging these Internet of Things devices and then finally this whole medical and personal and family information information about when I am and am not in my house I expect that to be personal but what it, it, is that hackable uh, is the fact that I may have some medical medical condition that's reported by some device that I'm wearing is that hackable those are really clear issues that need to be resolved and so if there's one area in IOT that's a real challenge it is the security and that has to be very well monitored because if that gets out of, out of hand acceptance will go out of the window oops let me 